everyone, you're tuning in once again to Deeper Grooves, Musicians on Music, hosted by Cliff Beach and sponsored by California Soul Music Record Label. Today, I have the honor and privilege of talking with a guest, AJ Croce, the son of Jim Croce, talking about his latest album, By Request, that's out on all streaming platforms now. This is a great cover song album that features songs by such luminaries as Randy Newman and Billy Preston. Please help me welcome AJ. Hello. Super excited to talk to you about your your album. I saw that Jeff had posted, you know, that it had hit Billboard and a bunch of other stuff. So congratulations. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, so, uh, yeah, if we can get into it. I wanted to chat about the latest album, By Request. How did you come sure. to make this album of cover songs? Uh, well, <laughs> there's there's a number of answers. I think the simple the simplest one was that I was I was sort of thinking about all of these great evenings that I had at my place, entertaining friends, and sort of ended up playing music. You know, uh, some of my friends were musicians, some of and and some are just fans of music, and they would ask for a particular song. Hey, do you know this song by so and so? You know, Billy Preston or Sam Cooke or Alan Toussaint. It could be any you know Beach Boys song, and so. It was that simple. It was these memories of great evenings with with friends. Okay, and then so were those songs specifically that all those friends types of requested, or were they songs that were kind of near and dear to your heart, or kind of spoke to you for a certain reason? I think I think both in a way. You know, all of the artists that whose songs I performed are um, special to me. You know, in one way or another. I grew up playing jazz and rock and roll and you know, R&B. I was playing a lot in, you know, blues, of course, playing a lot in uh, jazz bars, solo. And so I, I grew up playing standards and playing covers before I, before I could play my original stuff, you know? And um, so it was, it was sort of a natural thing. You know, I really had to narrow this down because I used to entertain quite a bit and so it was it was just particular songs particular nights certain things that stuck out uh for example with the randy newman song that i did yeah i'm a huge randy newman fan this was not particularly my favorite randy newman song it was about the evening and how much fun it was and the person that requested it was more familiar with the flaming groovies version and so i i thought oh this would be fun to treat it you know sort of tip the hat to randy newman but also you know to the flame and groovies and and in the process i decided to produce it as if as if little richard sat in with the flame and groovies and played a randy newman song so there it's a little bit eclectic certainly eccentric in in the way that i chose to produce it gotcha so we get a little bit of flame and groovies we get a little bit of randy newman we get a little bit of little richard and we get a right. lot of you <laughs> exactly through the whole thing yeah and so each you know each song was a was a different thing a friend of mine you know big faces fan asked for that one night and so i played it and and uh you know same thing with the tom waits thing um some of the songs i played more true to the you know original recording sometimes that was because i was playing with other musicians and they knew a particular version so i played played it a little straighter in other cases i sort of had my way with the with the arrangements. Excellent. And so uh, that's interesting how that all came organically together. And you were talking about your musical origins. Now, I saw that you were quoted as saying, I learned to play music by listening and playing along to the radio and to records. At some uh-huh. point, I was given the music of Ray Charles and Stevie Wonder as inspiration, which it was, and it has uh-huh. been ever since. So do you consider them like some of your major influences? Because your album really kind of runs the gambit of all different types of stuff with season. Oh, yeah. You know, so. of course, they were... They were uh, sort of seminal influences. And, you know, even though I've played their music live and, uh, you know, on shows in a particular thing, I, I would feel a little more intimidated by, you know, recording one of their songs, I think, just because it held a special place, you know, in, in when I was learning. And even though I played with Ray Charles and, and he approved... <laughs> I still, I still <laughs> felt like it was a, sort of an ominous thing to to tackle, but you know my influences are really varied, extremely broad, um, from Brazilian music and 
and African music to to jazz and roots music, rock and roll, of course, all kinds of New Orleans music. And there's there's really nothing I haven't tried to to play, at least for the sake of learning, you know. As you should. I mean, I think the a huge catalog of, of the American songbook and beyond and there's so many great songs and so many great artists and so many great covers. And I really enjoy the old school approach of how uh, the song was great. You know, tons of people would cover it. And we don't see that as we see that a little bit, I guess, with YouTube and stuff like that now, but not as much on records as it was. And, and, and yes, that's right. You know, I mean, there's not really a band like I can Tina Turner, you know, there's not a, there's not a, there's not really a band that takes recent compositions and sort of reimagines them in a in a real soulful way and and i think there's you know there's a place for it. i don't think i'm necessarily the person to do it but i sort of did in this case it was sort of more like a house party in my opinion you know i wanted it to feel like you were coming over to my place i recorded it live um sang live you know i i played multiple instruments on this so i had to overdub like i, I would finish playing piano and then go play a guitar part or play a guitar part and then move to the organ play it you know and i was singing and playing live so it really has that feel and playing live with the band and yeah it's it there's just i don't know if it's that there's not as many compositions that people that resonate with as many people as there were at one time or if it's just that people are more interested in in recording their own music yeah, I'm sure there's a little bit of a mix of both. I think also it has to do with the industry and, and how they push mm-hmm. people to, to do certain things. Like they're like, oh, this song is really hot. You should do a song just like that or get it. Work with yeah, exactly. Like well, I, I, yeah. And as a writer, you know, especially during a period when I was writing a lot for other people, doing a, you know 90 co-writes a year for a publisher, Wow. It was always so and so just, you know, this was their last hit. They want something the same tempo, you know, not only the same tempo, a lot of times they wanted, they pretty much wanted the same song, just slightly different, you know? And um, so you end up chasing the thing that they had done 18 months ago. Right. Yeah. And when you look at mm-hmm. people like Stevie Wonder and Ray Charles, I mean, they really made things independent of what was going on i think at the time they just made what was true to their hearts and fingers absolutely voices yeah Uh, i think especially ray charles in a way because he he went so far outside of any particular genre you know from the very beginning where he was sort of sounded like trying to sound like nat king cole to when he sort of found his sound to doing country songs and then you know pop songs and you know all kinds of things. Uh, Stevie found what he did and, and just, he was so good at it. It was, it was an innate talent and just sort of followed it. Yeah. And it's interesting about both because Ray Charles was pushed by the producers to really find his own sound. And Stevie Wonder had to actually fight Motown uh, with Marvin Gaye and several others to be able to actually create the music they wanted. Absolutely. Super prolific. So it's good to see that people are, kind of taking charge of themselves. Now, you also come from a musical family. I know both your father very well and, and your mother, Ingrid. They had a group together as well as his solo stuff. How did that uh-huh. kind of shape your music? Well, um, it's interesting. I mean, because it was around and it was on the radio. So, you know, I heard I heard it at my house and I heard it on the radio. But more than anything, you know, I listened to my father's record collection. You know, it was so diverse from mm-hmm. Otis Redding and... Fats Domino and old rock and roll stuff to, you know, Woody Guthrie and and old Elizabethan folk. And, you know, it was all over the map. Plenty of old blues, Mississippi John Hurt and Blind Blake, and Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee, and Pink Anderson. I mean, Fats Waller, Bessie Smith, all that stuff was in there. And so I, as a kid, I had lost my sight and I would go to the record player and I would find pull records out randomly put them on see if i liked it if i if i if i liked it i'd put it over on the left side and then it was like it might be random still what i'd pick out but i knew it was going to be good (laughs) and then as a as a a songwriter and a storyteller you know i think especially listening to the tapes of my father tell stories that was really influential 
because it was a style of performance that didn't exist too much when, by the time I was starting to perform. The, the idea of storytelling uh, with the songs and letting people know where it came from, but also being entertaining in the process was sort of a lost art. You know, there's some folk artists that were doing it, but it was that, you know, there was a sense of, of humor about it and, and as, as well as it being serious, you know, and you could tell a funny story about a serious song. And I think that was really, that, you know, certainly inspired me when I was, when I was young, but there was all kinds of things that inspired. When I saw uh, Harry Belafonte perform, I was inspired to perform. It wasn't the music, it was his performance and his just general gift of being able to communicate. Same thing I felt when I saw Dick Gregory as a kid, I, I, I had to go to, for two nights. I, the way he connected with an audience was amazing. I was just talking about something else this morning. I, the first band that I played with was sort of a 60s R&B garage band. I played a Vox Continental and we did covers of like Etta James and Bird songs and Arthur Alexander, and, you know, stuff like that. And the drummer had this bootleg of uh, Steve Winwood when he was about 16 playing a Ray Charles song. And I heard it and I'm like, oh, this is it was it was inspiring because I heard someone else that was my age, even that was 20 years earlier and uh, really connected with it. I thought I can do that. I can I can. I can play that. You know, obviously I need to keep practicing. I got to keep on learning, but I felt like I was on the right path. And sometimes just hearing someone that's your age doing something that was unusual for something for, you know, someone their age, it can be inspiring. Definitely, definitely. And it's nice to have something to aspire to and be inspired in that way. So I want to take a little bit of time moving away from the latest album and kind of going back to the history of your long career. And so with your self-titled debut, named after you, AJ Kirchie, it was produced by the legendary Grammy winner and movie soundtrack artist T-Bone Burnett. Um, and John Simon. And John yeah. Simon as well, yes. And so I want to know how I was working with them. And I have you quoted early on reflecting, I was into every kind of music. You might say I was unfocused, but I consider it an eclectic taste in music to be the foundation of versatility. And so is that accurate of how you were in the time of starting out uh, and then obviously working with these? You know, pirates? Yeah. It, you know, I don't know when I said that, but I still feel the same. I, I, I feel this, you know, I feel the same about it. I, I think that album was put in the jazz category and that was a bit challenging because it's, it was a relatively small genre and I and I wanted to be able to have the freedom to do all kinds of things. The next album I did was with Jim Keltner and had a lot of great players, as did the first, you know, Ry Cooter and just so, so, yeah. so many good, D- David good Hidalgo players. And you know? Los Lobos David and Hidalgo, Lobos. yeah. Yeah, there were there were so many great players on it. But it was a much different sounding record. It was I had I, I sort of started to sw- figure out who I was as a writer, as a, as a musician. I think it was much more mature, showed maybe less of my, my influences than the first album, but we all have to start somewhere. And I started really young. Um, the first one I recorded when I was 19. So I think that's, that's what happens. Yeah, definitely a lot of living to do. So then moving from the first two albums into the third, Fit to Serve, mm-hmm. you recorded in Memphis, yeah. and that was produced by yeah. Jim Gaines. He produced uh-huh. Van Morrison, Santana, Steve yeah. Miller Band. So kind of like, how was the evolution now moving into a more mature sound? Uh, that was, you know, that was an interesting segue, honestly. You know, I'd been with a major on the first two. And so, you know, RCA was putting it out, BMG had bought the little label that I had signed to that it first was a subsidiary and then it just be, got swallowed by BMG. And so when I did the third one that was with an independent label called Ruth Records, that was, it was a big change. In, in a way, it felt as if, you know, I knew it wasn't going to reach the same audience because you just didn't have the same machine. I didn't have the same machine behind me. It also gave me a certain freedom to be able to write and record the songs that I wanted without someone looking over my shoulder the whole time. You know, yeah. um, it's it's kind of funny in a way. It's sort of a full circle in that. And I worked with Jim Gaines on that. And then 
starting probably four years ago, started working with Gary Malibur, who was on all, who was on those Van Morrison records that Jim Gaines worked and also was with, uh, worked with Jim Gaines on all of the Steve Miller band stuff. He was the drummer with that band from 69 to 85 or something. So it, it's kind of funny. And, you know, he knew Jim very well from all those projects. I think it's, it's interesting. You know, we end up, if you keep playing music long enough, you end up running into old friends. I just spoke Robin Ford uh, this morning, who, you know, is, is someone that's, who's a neighbor and an old friend. He was on my first album. He's on a couple things on my second. And, and he's also on by request on um, better day. So it's funny if you keep doing it long enough, you end up having a chance to work with some of the folks that, that you really enjoyed working with, you know, again, doesn't, it's not always as easy as it might seem. Oh yeah, definitely. The good things kind of cycle, cycle back mm-hmm. and the, 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 the industry, it shrinks. It becomes so much smaller as you start to bump into the same people. They're all you know, yeah. like-minded individuals. And so then uh, moving on from there, you move into the next album, which was Transit. And yeah. uh, you had been playing a lot of blues based music for a long time and you were trying something new. The album I was. was the album was compared to critics like the work of John Lennon and Elvis Costello, Bob Dylan, Van Morrison, and the New Times. Gwen Stark of the New Times said, you are a song crafter of the first order. So what was the departure in this uh, album? Like what was different about that one versus the other three? Uh, it was a real departure. You know, it was a real departure in the sense that the label that I was with, that that was a different label. They sort of, they were looking for something that was a little more pop driven, even though the, you know, it had a, a root space for sure. It was definitely more pop driven. The producer on it was more known for working with alternative rock bands like Hole and L7 and Massey Star. So the whole sound of it was very different than anything I'd done. Also, I felt a little naked on that record in the sense that after Fit to Serve, well, actually, when I started recording Fit to Serve, I lost my voice. And I had just been touring for so many years and didn't really give my voice a break. And I'd never had lessons. And so after after that album, I, you know, I wasn't really able to take a break like I should have uh, to rest my voice for six months or whatever. So I ended up taking singing lessons and in the process i think transit sort of felt i felt a little naked because i was singing in a in a way that was fresh it was new to me oh yeah that could definitely happen when you when you strip down your voice and and start to build it back up again uh, with those types of vocal issues now then moving into the next album which is also named after you Adrian and james Gucci. it's it's even more pop oriented and at yes. the time, it was one of the only independent produced albums of that year to top the top 40, which is no small feat. Uh, in Europe, it was on the charts for six months, sitting in between U2 yeah. and Coldplay. And that same uh-huh. year, it also won Best Pop Album at the San Diego Music Awards. And you self-produced yeah. that one. So how had you yeah. grown as an artist and as a producer by then to create that for yourself? Well, that was my first, the first album I got to produce of my own. I put it out on my label. And at the time, you know, it had been a couple, it had been a few years since I'd recorded an album and went into the studio in 2003. That came out in 2004, but I started a label in 2003 and I met with the folks at Yep Rock who started Red Eye Distribution. They said they'd give me a hand putting the thing out. They were really open about what I wanted to do and, and were very supportive. And, and I had been making a lot of the, decisions you know with the indie labels that i'd been on for a cup for five or six years and had a really good sense of how the business worked and how the how to promote the the albums and so it was it felt really good to know that it was possible to to get into that sort of world of pop radio and top 40 with something that's actually kind of outside the box for for that genre what i was doing yeah it was it was definitely more pop driven but more in the way of harry nielsen or 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 the kinks or something like that than it was like like what else was like u2 or coldplay for sure (laughs) you know 
That's interesting. And then, uh, you know, that album paved other doors to open in 2006. On Seedling, you had Cantos, and you yeah. notably featured Ben Harper. So what was it like working with him? You know, we had met right before both of our albums had come out. We were on a show in France, festival in France, and there was a TV studio, and they were, we were both at the, at the studio, and we just hit it off. We just really hit it off. We had like, you know, we were like minded in the taste of the music. We had both been on tour with Taj Mahal before the albums, you know, came out. And I think, you know, when we just started, the first thing we did was started playing together. You know, we started playing a Skip James song and it was it, un, unrehearsed. And all of a sudden realized there's cameras on us, you know, and I think that was what the that festival was about was really introducing artists to other artists. And we just sort of stayed in touch over the years. And I asked if he was into coming in and playing on something. And he said, yeah, absolutely. So it was, it, you know, that album really carried over from the Adrian James Croce album because it was, you know, same group plus, you know, plus him on that. But. It was, you know, same group of musicians. It was a little bit more, probably a little more introspective than, than the self second self titled, which, by the way, I named it that because for the first four albums, journalists always asked me what the AJ stood for. So I figured I would, I would just name it after my full name. That would give the answer. And ironically, people, people said, have you asked if I had changed my name? <laughs> so it, it was still a topic of conversation. And then after that, I, I sort of went even a bit more introspective with, with um, Cage of Muses, which was really a collection of songs that I had been writing and hadn't been finished. But for some reason, I, I held on to those particular songs, um, which I don't usually do. In general, I think I'm more inclined to finish a song. If I don't finish it, it's not something as special to me. But with with those, they were all special. And so for the project I had in mind, I you know, finished these those particular tracks. I think there were 12 on there and recorded them. And it was very live, like everything I do. You know, there, there are two exceptions probably are... are me in the bar and transit. Um, everything else has been recorded live. Wow. And then, yeah, also Cage of Muses uh, received a four-star review in Rolling Stone, which is definitely not uh, an everyday occurrence for sure, as I've had a lifetime subscription to Rolling Stone uh, for the last 20 years. And, and they don't get yeah. those out all the time. So that's, that's amazing, especially being an album on your own a label. Now, moving on from that into 2013, you signed with Compass mm -hmm. Records. And you yeah. released 12 Tales. And I think this is an interesting story that you recorded two songs with each of the six producers in five U.S. cities over a year. Mm -hmm. And you released one song per month on iTunes and then the next year, the CD and the vinyl. And so, I mean, you have a who's who's list of producers on here. You have Cowboy Jack Clement, who was famous for his work with Elvis Presley and Johnny Cash. Rock and Roll Hall of Famer Alan Toussaint, obviously the Swamp Boogie, New Orleans style producer Dr. John and Irma Thomas, Golden Globe nominated Mitchell Froome, who has worked with uh, Randy Newman and Crowded House, the Grammy winning engineer and producer Kevin Killen, who produced multiple albums for Elvis Costello, notable A&R mm -hmm. executive and record producer Tony Berg, whose sessions have included Bob Dylan and Fiona Apple and Greg Cohen. Uh, the avant-garde bass player and producer known for his work with Tom Waits. And you also co-wrote a few of the songs on 12 Tales, including one song with the famed songwriter and famed Wrecking Crew member Leon Russell. So what was it like yeah. making this monumental album? And I know that's a huge undertaking. It was it was a challenge, man. It was a challenge. The Fortunately, you know, the first person that I reached out to was, was Cowboy. Cowboy gave me my first session when I was 17 in Nashville and we had stayed in touch ever since. And so it was, it was a thrill getting together with him. He was, you know, he, he wasn't well at the time, you know, he was sick, but he was, he was present for the whole, for the whole session. We recorded live at his place and each, each producer really, it was really interesting to see how each producer worked. In the case of Mitchell Froome, I learned, I learned a lot in about a very sort of simple thing that you would think about, which is the way to record vintage instruments, the way he, he approached it. I had always 
been a vintage you know, guitar collector, amp collector, played old keyboards and organs and basses and so forth. But his idea was that you take you take this instrument that has this inherent sort of soul and juju about it and find a way to make it sound like it's never sounded before. And that was sort of a revelation to me because I had always tried to just mic it the best possible way that I could to capture its essence, uh, which is what a lot of, a lot of engineers do, a lot of producers do. And thinking about it from a different angle where you're saying, well, that thing, it's already going to sound amazing. How do you make it sound amazing in a way that no one's ever heard? That really opened up my mind to to a new way of of recording and thinking about the way instruments could sound. So, and that was kind of what I was looking for with that record. I really I had produced uh, three albums of my own at that point, and I was ready for a lesson. You know, and I thought it would be fun to work with all these different people. Greg Cohen, you know, that was really special for me, too, because you know, Greg Cohen and I went down to New Orleans uh, with an engineer named Al Schmidt, legend, to record my first album. And we record probably half a dozen songs. It was with a great band. It was Long Hair's backing band. And the record company heard it, and it was pretty outside the box, far too outside the box for them to feel comfortable with releasing it as my first album. And, you know, that was that was disappointing because it was my first record, first time going in to record my stuff in that way. And I'd always wanted to work with Greg again. And, and you know, 12 Tales was a perfect opportunity. Oh, yeah. And it did so well. And, uh, you know, definitely see how it continues to lead you through your your career. Now, you have performed as an opening act for Carlos Santana, Rod Stewart, Aretha Franklin, Dr. John, Lyle Lovett, James Brown, B.B. King, Dave Matthews, Earth, Wind & Fire, and Ray Charles. And you sat in with many notable artists live, including Willie Nelson, Ben Harper, Ray Cooter, the Neville Brothers, Waylon Jennings, David Hidalgo from Los Lobos. You have also performed on national television on shows including The Tonight Show with Jay Leno, The Late Show with David Letterman, Late Night with Conan O'Brien, The Today Show, Good Morning America, MTV, CNN, and Austin City Limits. Do you have a favorite live performance collaboration or a memory that you can share? Oh, wow. You know, each, each one of those was its own sort of crazy experience. Playing before Ray Charles and then coming off stage and have him give, give me a hug. So he was standing and, you know, on the side of the stage listening. And that was a real thrill. Um, I felt like at that point, I think I was 21 or something. I felt like uh, maybe I was 20 years old. I don't know. Felt like I, I didn't need to do any more in my career. I felt like I had done everything I had set out to do. <laughs> and, you know, I think there were so many amazing, crazy experiences. I, I was never really comfortable doing television, but as far as performance goes, it, it was always fun. And writing with Leon Russell was always fun. You know, we wrote probably a dozen, almost a dozen songs together. And getting to play together was really fun. Same thing with, you know, playing with Alan Toussaint for me was a huge thrill. He was and a huge, huge influence. From the time I was probably 13, I had seen this Jim Jarmusch film and heard him playing, and it was an Irma Thomas song, but I just needed to know everything about the music and who made it and discovered Alan Toussaint and all he had done with her, with Lee Dorsey, you know, Ernie Kate Doe, of course, the meters. And I, re- I didn't really learn about Dr. John until after my first record, but I had listened to James Booker and Long Hair and, you know, course fat domino and the nevels meters and all that stuff that was and you know when i went to new orleans he would come and sit in with me and it was it was a thrill he was just a, a gentleman you know very dignified man yeah who wrote tons of amazing songs for so many great artists and had some amazing albums himself uh and yeah. a staple of new orleans so now i have a couple of rapid fire questions as we start to wrap up uh, so okay. w- what's next musically for you? Well, uh, the, you know, the lockdown has provided me with a lot of time to practice and write in genres that I had never really thought about going into. So I've been experimenting with all kinds of different things from classical music, Indian music, 
to uh, you know world music in general. There's a lot of new songs that I'm really happy with. I look forward to recording. Also, there's a project after after the next project, Two Away, that I'm I'm working on with a group called Andy Ballas, and it's uh, deals with origin stories and something I had been working on for about six years when they joined the party and became part of the concept. So there's a there's a lot. I'm also working on a bunch of, of film projects, one feature film as a producer and four documentaries in different capacities. So there's a lot of different things, a lot of creative projects that uh, I'm really thrilled about digging into. Yeah, Andy Ballas, that's the name. I, I think they were nominated for a World Music Grammy this year and uh, definitely been holding it down for many, many years uh, for global music in New York. And so uh, that's going to be fun. It's going to be exciting and eclectic for sure. And I think yeah. we're becoming a more global society, so why not? What advice would you give a newbie starting out in music? Oh, wow. Uh, don't give up, first of all. <laughs> Second of all, um, I think to really listen to as many different things as you can, to really open your ears and open your heart to all kinds of music. The more you listen to, the more you learn, not just intellectually, but emotionally. I think, you know, it, there's something that music has that allows people to become sort of uh, surrogate empaths in a way. I think it's a necessity for for young writers to dig into that. Definitely. I definitely agree wholeheartedly. And so what do you want your musical legacy to be? Wow. I really have never thought about my legacy. So I don't know. I guess I'd have to leave it to the people that are going to write about it if they do. Oh, that, well, yeah, well put. I mean, I think it may be too early to tell, but... But uh, already you have a long legacy of your catalog of music, for sure, and longevity of music. Anyone that can stay in music for many, many years, it, it shows a testament to their will and, and, and spirit and being able to stomach the roller coaster of the ups and downs, but also so many exciting times that you've had. So we look forward to all of these new albums that are coming out and what is to come. I think you're going to continue to uh, iterate and reinvent and continue to um, to work with other people and collaborate and, and stretch yourself as you practice and grow and continue to songwrite. So that's awesome. Uh, so now Thank where you. can people find you online? Well, they can find me on Instagram at AJ Croce. They can find me on Facebook, of course, at AJ Croce and uh, on my website, which is ajcrocemusic.com. So I'm around and you can find the music pretty much everywhere music's sold, I think. That's that's not my job on this album, so I get to I get to be a little aloof about that stuff. <laughs> nice, but all the links are definitely available on your website, yeah. music.com. So we'll push people there. And what should uh, they dive into first? If they're looking at your catalog. Should they dive into the latest records? Should they dig, dig into the back catalog. Where should they start if they want to learn more about you first musically? You know, I think it, it might be interesting if, they've, if they heard some of, of my request to go sort of backwards and see what, see what you find. I think going back to uh, the album previously, the one I, I did with Dan Penn, just like Medicine, is, it's, it's a good bridge from hearing by request to go into the original music and, and, and just sort of go backwards and see what happens. I think that's sort of an interesting way to do it. Yep. I think nothing like starting with now and then going back to the beginning and then they can make the, they can see the evolution for themselves. And so sure. with that, AJ, I think we've covered everything. Thank you so much for being on the podcast Deeper Grooves today. We had a blast talking with you, learning about the new record and your long career track. And we look forward to all of the new things happening in 2021. We'll circle back to your management when everything is said and done so that you guys have links to everything and hopefully we can connect and keep the conversation going. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. You're welcome, Edgy. Take care of yourself. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks again for listening to Deeper Grooves, Musicians on Music, hosted by Cliff Beach and sponsored by California Soul Music Record Label. We had a blast talking with AJ Croce about his latest album, By Request. That's hit the Billboard charts and it's out on all streaming platforms now. Definitely go check it out and then listen through his back catalog backwards to hear all of the great music that he's had over his long, illustrious career. 
We would like to thank our engineer, Tim Hall, and 1192 Studios for mixing and mastering this recording today. If you like what you hear and you want to hear more, you can check us out online at www.californiasoulmusic.com forward slash deeper grooves or anchor.fm forward slash deeper grooves. Until then, stay true to yourself. Keep it rocking. We'll talk to you soon.